there are variables, there, there's equations, you just change one little thing. You change your definition of the West to include, obviously, it's staring us in the face, it is our, it is our neighbor to the South, is it not? Once you start to think of what the West is differently, rather than the 20th century or 19th century or even 18th century understanding of the West, you have a whole different projection for where the fu what the future of the West is going to be. And I believe that the introduction of the South America factor into our understanding of the strategic West is going to have that kind of massive global impact in terms of changing the entire fate of the world. Because it will, people will stop talking about East replacing the West, China replacing America, Pacific replacing it, and realize that, in fact, the core of the world, the core of a peaceful world system is still this triangular, three-pillared West. It's also the East, but it's very much still the West, and we don't have to fear its demise anytime soon. And I think that that's going to be, uh, again, a big shift, a big chain reaction uh, that's going to take place uh, as, as our psychology shift. And, and Barack Obama has been a big part of that shift because at the height of our concerns and, and, and the headlines being dominated by the events of Japan and Libya, does anyone know where he went? He went to Brazil, right? He went to Chile, he went to El Salvador. And people were saying, don't go, don't go, this is crazy, you can't do this right now, you can't, what, what the hell are you doing going to South America, you know, right now in the midst of all of this? And he went because it was March 2011, the 50th anniversary of the Alliance for Progress, which was the Kennedy administration's attempt to take advantage of the Cold War dynamic and strengthen relations with Latin American countries. And it led to a tremendous amount of uh, investment in Latin America, partnerships with Latin America, infrastructure building in Latin America, and really helped to spark um, the modernization of South America during that time. So Barack Obama went to South America to more or less herald, although with much less fanfare than has been done with, with other regions and other policies, a new alliance for progress. And that is going to, if you mark these words, um, you know, force us to rethink the West in the coming years as we, as we um, start to realize just how st stiff the competition is from the East. Because I mentioned energy security. All the oil and gas and energy we will ever need for centuries is right here in our own hemisphere. We will don't need Saudi Arabian oil. It's, um, in any case, a diminishing component of our overall energy supply, and a reindustrialization, which is what the Alliance for Progress in its original incarnation was all about. And in fact, there is evidence to suggest that American companies are starting to shy away a bit from outsourcing to Asia. It's getting very expensive, isn't it, uh, because of rising wages in China. There's, of course, a huge currency risk associated with it. We don't have control over China's po currency policy. There is, a, of course, a geographic proximity issue. Latin America is, of course, right here. And then we realize that we have a far better uh, political relationship with Latin American countries and can have more mutually beneficial joint ventures with Latin American suppliers and companies rather than simply outsourcing everything to environments where it's very difficult for us to profit from. So there's many thing, indications pointing to a seismic kind of a geostrategic shift in landscape that we haven't really been paying attention to. And I've actually long argued in, in, um, in my first book, uh, even more than in this new one, that we need to be doing that. The reason um, that I think in that way about regions is because it's long been the missing dimension of how we frame and think about international relations. International relations, by definition, right, we just think about states and interstate relations, and we look at bilateral uh, dynamics between the United States and other countries, and that tends to be what we think of as the sum total of, of international relations. Then we graft a layer on top of that of, um, of, of global governance, intergovernmental organizations, the United Nations, and, and, and various alliances, and so forth. We're, we're missing this component of regionalism and regionalization, such as the European Union, NAFTA, the Union of South American Nations, as it's now called, ASEAN plus three, the ASEAN Regional Forum, the Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC countries, even the African Union, which has come quite a ways, I would say, in the last uh, uh, 10 years. We, we don't really talk about that. And yet so much of what passes for world political and economic activity isn't so much international relations as it is interregional relations. So you know, when, when we think about diplomacy, we think about these bilateral summits where Hillary Clinton goes or Barack Obama goes. My argument is that the most important summits in the world are the 
EU Asian summits, the Latin American African summits, the Sino African summits. When those summits happen, they don't make the front page of the New York Times because, surprise, surprise, we are not part of them. We're not, we weren't invited to them. But those are the ones where plane loads of business people and officials fly across the continents and strike hundreds of billions of dollars of trade agreements and strategic relations eventually wind up tracking to those emerging uh, uh, economic and trade and finance dynamics between these regions. So interregional relations today is as important, probably more important than international relations. Because it's hard to take a lot of states in the world all that seriously, isn't it? This is the other, one of the other big motivations uh, in this book is trying to move beyond the idea of the state, which is not to say the state it has collapsed. It's, there, there's a big rhetorical divide there on what is the future of the state. And some people say the state is gone. It's all about cities and companies and non-state actors and markets. Other people say, no, the state is strong. Look at the financial crisis. The state is back. It bailed out all the companies. They were so dependent on it. I'm halfway in between. To me, there's not one kind of state, right? There are states like the United States and China and Germany that can bail out failing industries and have deep pockets and print lots of money and so forth. That's about three countries out of 200. Then there are states like Yemen and Libya and Congo. How seriously are we supposed to take them? How long are they going to last? And I'll tell you this. When the United Nations was founded 60 some years ago, there were uh, less than 80 or so countries in the world. So in the last 60 years, we've created how many countries? Over 100. They're not all Jeffersonian democracies. Most of them aren't democracies at all. They're certainly not all strong states, right? Most of them aren't even viable to begin with. And why should we expect that just because they were born 60 years ago over the last 60 years, they've been engaged in state building, nation building, developing their infrastructure, modernizing, becoming viable members of the international community. Well, they haven't, because turn on your television sets, and in fact, you see dozens of them, one by one, falling apart. Because that's what they've been doing for the last six, 60 years, is falling apart. Not growing stronger, they've been falling apart. And um, I started to study this quite a while ago, and. One of the main chapters of this book is about what I call post-colonial entropy, which is just a fancy way of saying that about 100 countries in the world have been falling apart since the day they were born, rather than getting stronger and more viable. Right? And that is exactly what is happening in Egypt and Yemen and Pakistan and elsewhere. What do they all have in common? They're not all Arab. They're not all in the Middle East. Some are in Africa. Some are in Asia. What they all have in common is that they're post-colonial countries that are less than three generations old. And let me tell you what's happened in those three generations. Because it's the fundamental driver and cause, not driver, but cause of the Arab Spring. It's not Facebook. It isn't Mohammed Bazizi who self-immolated. It's not WikiLeaks. Right? The fundamental cause of the Arab Spring is this post-colonial entropy. It's that for the last 60 years, what all of these countries have in common that their populations have tripled or quadrupled from 20 million or 30 million in Egypt to 80 some million, 30 or 40 million in Pakistan uh, in 1947 to 180 million today, uh, um, uh, Ethiopia, Eritrea, you name it, quadrupling of populations. Second, no new real investment in infrastructure. What passes for a good road or railway is what the British left behind in so many of these countries. So no new investment in infrastructure to support four times the population. Third factor, corruption, corruption, corruption. Regimes that we backed, or the Soviets backed, or the Europeans coddled, games were played for the entire duration of the Cold War. And then even after we abandoned them, corruption certainly continued. <laughs> corruption didn't stop. So they've not had good governments since the first governments. That euphoric post-colonial moment across Africa and the Middle East that, had, that was accompanied by a meaningful nationalism um, by leaders who had credibility and support, the Nassers of the world, such as in Egypt, who were popular. They're gone, right? It's winner take all kind of politics. Uh, there aren't many memorable Mandela's right around uh, around Africa, right? And then with that within that leadership issue, there's the succession 
crisis that inevitably ensues. Can Mubarak hand off power to his son? Can Gaddafi and his son continue to rule, or his sons? How about uh, King Mohammed VI of Jordan? How about uh, Bashar Assad of Syria? How about Saad Hariri of Lebanon? How about King Abdullah of Jordan? The last six or seven names I just mentioned are all young men who took power or were about to assume power in their 30s. They all have at least one Western degree from a European or American university, speak English or French. We're all painted as the voice of reform, and coddled and supported by us, championed by us, very much welcome in Washington, all of them. Uh, and yet, not one of them is remotely as powerful as their fathers, which very much helps to explain what's happened in, uh, in Egypt and elsewhere. So the succession crisis. So you've got overpopulation, no good, good infrastructure, uh, failure of national identity, uh, uh, corruption on a massive scale, succession crises. These are the fundamental causes, the underlying causes of what has become this Arab Spring. But what they really reveal is just how brittle this idea of the state is, as if all states are created equal. Because really, they're not. Uh, very few are like us. And so that's what brings us to um, the real, in the theoretical kind of backbone of, of this book, which is what I call systems change. Uh, it's not my term. It's a very sort of germane political science term. My first book uh, was about structural change. Structural change is when you move from a unipolar world to a multipolar world, or a multipolar world to a unipolar world. When you change the number of powers that you have, that's a change in the, it's called structures change, stru structural change. There's lots and lots of books about that now, because most people have come to accept that there are rising powers out there, such as the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and so on. Systems change is very different. Systems change in history is when you change the type of actors that you're dealing with in the first place. When you say it's not all states, that was just the Westphalian period, that was just uh, a few hundred years of history. But there was a whole thousands of years of history before that, and there we hopefully have thousands of years of history ahead of us. Will it be dominated by these rigid nation states with national borders and sovereign governments? Well, we only have a couple of hundred years of that to rely on, but before that, we had a much more complicated, overlapping world that was made up of uh, vast empires, territorial empires for sure, religious entities, the Catholic Church, Islam, whatever the case may be, cities. Cities have been drivers of history for millennia and are becoming ever more so today. Cities are a big part of the analysis in this book in terms of units that shape the future. Most of the world's population is now urban, as we know, as of a couple of years ago. Um, McKinsey predicts that by the year, well, we're in PwC's office, PwC predicts it too, let me give some credit to them, predicts that by the year 2030, 70% of the world's population is going to live in cities, so it's an urban world. Cities matter as much or more than many countries. Companies, of course, right, when we think of globalization, don't we think of multinational corporations and their supply chains. A friend of mine likes to speak of the independent republic of the supply chain in the sense that there are people who identify as much with the company they work for as with the country in which they're a citizen. And there's a good basis for this. Let me dwell on this for just 30 seconds. When I travel around and speak to uh, business school students or graduate students or whomever around the world, uh, most of them, even from the almighty BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, and China, will, are not citizens of the United States or European Union. Therefore, they do not have the luxury that all of us have, which is that we can more or less go almost anywhere in the world without a visa. Right? They depend on that multinational supply chain and that, and that having PwC or whoever as their employer, so they can travel around. And I've had Russians tell me over and over again, and Indians, thank God I work for Goldman Sachs or whomever, because otherwise I'd never be able to get out of this country. Because getting a visa would be such a pain, right, to do it over and over and over. It's a big deal for a younger generation. Are we talking about 0.4% or less of the world population? Yes, of course we are. But we're talking about a very important component of leadership who uh, has a different sense of identity. And of course, corporate power isn't just about the identity of, a, of some personnel. Of course, it's about economic resources, control over supply chains, and the extent to which Governments don't control companies, and companies don't control governments, as we see from the financial crisis and its aftermath. But there is a codependency, for sure. We did learn in the financial crisis uh, that Great Britain, that 40-some percent of its economy um, hinges or, or is based on 
not just the city of London, but London City, which is the financial district, which is Wall Street, right? I mean, so can you, does the government really control those banks? I mean, there's a massive amount of codependency there between states and firms. And this is absolutely not a new idea. This is an idea that not only is as old as the, you know, is really at a minimum as old as the field of international political economy, which goes back in some ways to, to Susan Strange and other scholars of the 60s and 70s, who had been talking for, for a very long time about this idea that there isn't just diplomacy between governments, but diplomacy between governments and companies and other actors, because who has the money makes the rules uh, to a large extent. And so that's not a new insight. But you layer that importance of corporations, importance of cities, also importance of communities. What is the role of social media and technology and changing identities and cloud communities and, and communities of belief and belonging and causes and so forth? That has to play a role as well, right? People have multiple kinds of affiliations these days. That plus countries, all of those different ways of thinking about it, all of that, you need a framework to bring all of that together rather than actually believing as you can tell, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's worthwhile to think about the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years and map onto it the United Nations system and really think that you have it all captured. Right? You really don't. You need to think about systems change, which means that you need a whole new diplomatic architecture that isn't just about what happens on 45th and 1st Avenue or what happens at the State Department or what happens at NATO or perhaps most dangerous of all, what happens at the G20? Because the G20 is the most recent in a very, very long line of mythical oversimplifications about how to run the world. And the title of the book is not an attempt to compete with uh, Tom Friedman, although that's a, maybe a derivative uh, benefit. But in any way, I've probably lost that race. It's because the book's about diplomacy. Right. This is actually, it's based actually on my, my doctoral thesis, which was not allowed to have a sexy title like that. Um, diplomacy, though, and the evolution of diplomatic systems, which is uh, the kind of field that I, that I come from, teaches us that for centuries, if not millennia, there have been, there's been very diverse, diffuse participation in diplomacy. It is very rarely, only in the last couple of hundred years, been just governments. Right. And so I'm very open to the idea that there is a corporate role in diplomacy, an NGO role in diplomacy, a philanthropic role in diplomacy, a religious role in diplomacy, and so on and so on. Because that's, in fact, the historical norm. So systems change forces us to think about a new diplomatic model. And the G20, which is an informal club group, 20 governments of very different capacities to contribute anything to world order. Argentina is not exactly my idea of a systemically relevant country anymore, right? Whereas Brazil is becoming one, and Saudi Arabia is sort of one, and Russia and China and so forth. They're, they're not all created equal. And it can't agree on much of anything, let alone run the world, right? They can't agree on financial regulation. Do you really think they're going to solve the Iranian nuclear crisis and bring peace to Palestine? or solve global climate change? No, the G20 isn't going to do that. So like I said, it falls in a long line of oversimplifications because we've been more or less trained for the last several hundred years. And these are ideas that go back to Immanuel Kant and perpetual peace, universal law. The idea that progress, progress in global governance, progress in how we run the world points towards, almost teleologically, towards a single world government or single set of institutions or one codified international law, ever more centralized bodies, the United Nations, well, starting with the Congress of Vienna in the 19th century, then the League of Nations, the United Nations, and now either reforming the UN, so UN plus, or G20, these types of things. Well, that's wrong. That's at least my thesis. That's totally wrong. We're not moving in the direction of ever more centralization so that you can point to the G20 or the G8 and say, aha, that's how we run the world. Thank God we've got this, the bumper sticker and it's all OK. Because we're proven wrong time and time and time again. Right? The United Na when, when George H.W. Uh, Bush stood 20 years ago, almost uh, 21 years ago, at the United Nations General Assembly and said it's a new world order, that famous term, NWO, which you all remember, uh, that when he gave that speech, there were, there were some implicit in, in, in assumptions. It was a unipolar world, right? We won the Cold War. There was no rival in sight. 
well, all of a sudden the world feels pretty multipolar to me. So we were wrong about that in just a short 20 years. It was a uh, multilateral world. The world was governed, was meant to be, at least that was also Bush's aspiration. Uh, Bush Sr. was very much a multilateralist, right? Uh, he gave that speech at the United Nations. And he said, the UN has been marginalized during the Cold War, but it will be back. It will sit in the middle of global governance. Well, that hasn't happened either, has it? No. So we were wrong about, about the uh, unipolar moment lasting as far as the eye could see. We were wrong about it being a multilateral world uh, de facto, and that everyone accepts the international architecture, Western-built post-war Bretton Woods type of systems that we had built. That proved to be wrong. Instead, we see regional systems and China doing its own thing and everyone dealing with everyone um, much more than we see the UN sitting at the center. The third assumption built into the New World Order uh, speech, sort of psychology or zeitgeist of the time, was that, uh, that it was a state-centric world, that it was just, you didn't need to think about how we run the world from the perspective other than capital cities of, of countries. Why would you, right? I mean, no one else needs to be involved in diplomacy, right? We can, states will be able to handle the world's problems, peace and security, uh, climate change, managing the economy, human rights, you know, you name the uh, item on the agenda. If you're gonna solve it, you're still gonna solve it via states, right? Well, that's obviously totally wrong as well. Right? Because you're not going to solve climate change by having yet another big summit in Bali or Copenhagen or Cancun or Kyoto or pick the next sunny resort of your choice and flying and burning lots of emissions, 190 diplomats there to have a big summit and to pass a document that says, yes, we will commit to reducing emissions. We won't say when, we won't say how, we won't say you know, anything, but we'll have a summit. That doesn't work anymore. Right? You're not, we know you're not going to solve climate change unless you have lots of investment in clean technology, which requires corporate innovation. Obviously, there are incentives involved, and smart governments are providing those incentives. But it's a, it's a, it's a public-private process, right? not just a governmental process. We know that you don't spread human rights around the world by renewing our commitment to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1946. Yes, a great document of the time that has convinced absolutely zero governments to all of a sudden become better on human rights, right? It takes so many other things, so many other kinds of pressure and lobbying and divestment policies and things like this. That's how you get, that's how you implement human rights, naming and shaming all kinds of mechanisms, sanctions, not just declarations and treaties, right? You name the problem out there, right? Counterterrorism, right? Do you need a global counterterrorism body now? Is that gonna end terrorism? Probably not. So you name the problem, the solution today does not involve just one agency, just one single point of contact, just one intergovernmental body, or just the United Nations, or just the United Nations plus its few selected allies who it wants to work with on that issue. No. There's that old saying, you know, any, any uh, if, it, well, I can't remember exactly what it is, but you know, for every, for every problem there's a solution that's neat, simple, and wrong, right? And that's, that's very much true in the case of global governance. So, Please be wary of any such bumper sticker solutions to how we go about running the world. I believe they're all fraudulent and uh, literally intellectually fraudulent. Because I was raised on this. I wrote papers about how let's expand the UN Security Council, right? And that's going to bring world peace. Well, it's not. <laughs> you can't convince me. The first op-ed I ever published in the New York Times about seven years ago was about UN Security Council expansion. What I proposed still hasn't happened. It's neither here nor there. The point was that you can't convince any, you can't make a, a plausible case that if you expand the Security Council from 15 countries to 21 countries or 25 countries, that it's gonna be more effective. I mean, it'll be more legitimate, right? It'll be more representative. But does that mean that 25 countries will agree on exactly what to do to intervene in Darfur or Libya or East Timor faster than 15 countries couldn't agree? No, you can't convince me of that. Now, I'm not saying it should stay at 15. I'm not saying it should be reduced to nine. I'm saying we shouldn't be having that debate because it's the wrong debate. So linking that back to regions and why I think regions are so important and why they're such a strong part of this book is, is that I think that rather than invest one more penny in the UN Environment Program or the United Nations Peacekeeping Forces or, or centralized institutions, I, I believe we should be supporting regional ones, an Arab League Peacekeeping Force, an African Union, the African Union Peacekeeping Force, um, and other types of regional development and self-management mechanisms. I believe a stable world of better global governance is going to be a one in which regional, regions with their own internal cultures and sensitivities and styles manage their own problems, right, as best as possible, and we help them, right? 
We teach another man to fish. We help others help themselves. We build regional self-reliance. We don't have to be global cop. We don't have to intervene everywhere. We don't have to be peacekeepers everywhere. There's lots of Africans who serve in peacekeeping missions under the UN, but now also under the African Union. Africans should be policing African problems, shouldn't they? It's, it's a more natural state of affairs, isn't it? Why do I have to convince you that that's more natural than us intervening everywhere and us providing the troops and us providing leadership and us having to convince the Chinese not to veto a resolution that has to do with Kosovo or Darfur. What does China have to do with Kosovo or Darfur? Is that, is that natural? It's not. It's much more natural, I think, to think in terms of regions. So I frame a lot of the arguments here uh, in terms of regions. Now, I don't want to go on and on because I do want to leave time um, for questions, but I want to say a couple of words about this public-private hybrid diplomatic future that is the main normative argument in this book, which I defend through lots of anecdotes. Um, you know, Even if the, the theory feels weak because it's not grounded in international law, it's not rooted in one power like the UN, it's not driven by one organization like, like the UN or, or one power like the US, it still seems to be the way in which we are going because of the ways in which when we, when we attempt to solve problems, again, like climate change or poverty. You know, I mentioned how climate change can't be solved without corporate innovation and clean technology. Now human rights uh, can't, won't work without pressuring uh, companies and supply chains and, uh, for better labor rights and things like this. Just take poverty. You know, where, are the best, where are the best ideas in poverty eradication or, or, or treatment have come from? Have they come from the World Bank? Have they come from these big summits and meetings? No, right? If I were to ask you all to write on the back of a piece of paper what's the best idea in poverty alleviation you've heard of in, in your whole life, you'd all write microcredit on, the, on that piece of paper, wouldn't you? And we all know where that came from. It didn't come from Washington, right? We know that it's ex experiments that began at the local level in Bangladesh, and India, and other countries, and then spread laterally, horizontally, bottom up, sideways, around the world. It wasn't um, a brilliant strategy paper from the IMF that everyone all of a sudden read and downloaded, and wow, we've just solved all the world's poverty problems, right? No, we experiment on the local level because of transparency and globalization and media. Um, you know, knowledge spreads, best practices spread, and remarkably, microcredit is everywhere in every corner of the planet Earth, including here in the United States. Now, it's not the only solution. I'm not saying governments don't matter. I'm not saying international organizations don't matter. I've been particularly harsh you know, on, on parts of the UN today. But, but you'll see in this book, I champion important segments of the UN, uh, the World Food Program and UNICEF and functional. They're called the functional agencies. They're the ones that really do something. They're the ones who go out and put their lives on the line and raise hundreds of millions of dollars and feed people every day and, and take care of refugees. And, the, and, and guess what? The best UN agencies like that aren't just UN agencies that are funded by governments. They're the ones who are the best at practicing what I call mega diplomacy, which is these public-private partnerships. Because when the World Food Program wants to do something, it needs to borrow office space from banks and get trucks uh, from Coca-Cola and FedEx and, uh, and partner with pharmaceutical companies or, or, or um, uh, food companies to develop um, high-protein foods and things like this to, take, to deliver to people. It, it can't do it alone. It doesn't have the money to do it. Uh, the tight leash that, that these organizations are unfortunately on forces them in a way to innovate. So they, they do a lot of good through this kind of partnership model that I strongly advocate here. And we see that model being replicated everywhere. So its components are not, or its principles aren't centralization under UN or US authority. Uh, you know, the, the, the principle is inclusion of NGOs, of companies, of governments, of intergovernmental bodies in these coalitions right, of various actors that have the knowledge or the resources or the money to get something done and to create a new model. And the Gates Foundation is obviously a very striking example of this. Because what's important about the Gates Foundation is not just that they spend a lot of money, wow, $50 billion in their endowment. They outspend um, all governments in the field of health uh, and therefore also poverty, except, except a few, such as the United States. It's not just the money. And by the way, they provide 40% of the operating budget of the World Health Organization. So for those of you who think that when you want to solve a global problem, go to the global body, so if you want to deal with health, well, we go to the WHO. Guess who funds the WHO? It's an NGO. Okay, that's how complicated this mega diplomacy already is. But it's also the Gates Foundation provides a model 
Because they don't say, well, let's just put lots of money into the national health system of Botswana, right? What they, one of their most pioneering programs uh, in Botswana, in fact, um, was called is the Africa Comprehensive HIV AIDS Partnership. And it involves the Gates Foundation, it involves Merck, the pharmaceutical company, it involves um, UNAIDS, the agency, it involves the government of Botswana, uh, it involves a whole host of corporate, NGO, governmental, non-governmental players to tackle the health problem. So it presents a new model of how you deal with health problems. It's not just the money. And what mega diplomacy is about fundamentally is about a different model of diplomacy, a different model of who you include, a different model of how they interact with each other and determine who's legitimate, who's accountable, who's in charge, right? Uh, rather than just assuming that the governments know what they're doing, because they very often don't. Uh, it's a competition of ideas. And that's how we eventually achieve progress, through a competition of ideas, not by just uh, assuming that the status quo of U.S. hegemony or U.N. centrality, and let's tinker with that, and it, it's works, it's a good horse, let's ride that one, right? Um, no, that's not how you achieve progress. You achieve a progress through the competition of ideas by which the G20 starts to get more attention, and so the U.N. realizes, hey, wait, we need to get our, get our game on if people are still going to bring their problems here. Or ASEAN starts to take care of a lot of problems. You don't find much presence of the United Nations in Asia. In fact, there's ever more Asian institutions. If you go to South America today, Brazil alone outspends the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank in development projects and infrastructure finance and other kinds of in loans to countries around South America. So it's competition. In the world of health, it's the Gates Foundation saying, we're going to compete with you and come up with better ways to solve these problems that haven't been solved. Right? Competition of ideas, competition of practices. What older principle do we have? That's ultimately through competition that we're going to have a better global governance. I argue it's going to be a very diffuse one. There's going to be lots of players, lots of different models, lots of actors. It sounds so chaotic. It sounds medieval, and that's why I talk about the Middle Ages so much in the introduction of this book. And yet, for me, perhaps paradoxically, it's actually very optimistic, because I think that we are unleashing a lot of energy, a lot of actors who should have a say, who do have resources, who do have ideas, who haven't gotten to the microphone or been able to have a voice on the world stage are getting it. I'm very optimistic about that, um, even in times like this. So I think that this mega diplomacy is the model for how we will start to run the world better. In a way, it's already happening. Right? It's a practice in search of a theory uh, more than it is uh, an idea that has to be defended against a system that very, very clearly does not work. Thanks very much. And there's a roving microphone. But we'll, we can just start right here. Could you discuss the economic competition rivalry between the Um, competition for jobs and economic competition. Yes. Between right. Regions, individual countries, and uh, the, the have countries, the have not countries. Well, there, there's a lot to, to say on that, first of all. We have um, long treated the world as divided into north and south, right? Developing, developed, mature, OECD level countries, which is only 32 countries, and the rest, basically. World trade has long been dominated by just about 10 countries. And now all of that is starting to change because of globalization, because of inter-regional trade patterns, for example. South-South trade, which used to be a pejorative term, it meant what the poor people do when they trade with other poor people. Like, oh, that was only, you know, 40, 50 billion dollars just like six years ago. When I was writing my first book about this, it was about 60, it was about 50 billion dollars with South-South trade. First of all, we don't really use the term anymore. It doesn't even make sense. All right, because countries of the South, like China, are now in the core of the global economy, as is Brazil and, and, and India, too. So we don't use it. But $50 billion, put in perspective, is basically what happens when one plane load of Chinese businessmen go to, go to, goes to Africa. That's like one trip in one year. Right? I mean, uh, Chinese investment in Brazil is like $20 billion something a year. So it's exploded, in other words. So the, everyone is trading with everyone, and one can't really create these simple categories anymore of haves and have-nots. And you know, it's, it's, um, it's, much, it's become much more complicated than that. But it's a very promising picture. So 
if you were going to really put one continent or peoples in the category of have-nots, you'd talk about Africans, right? But Africa, as many of you know, is the place experiencing, at least in terms of percentage, year-on-year -year growth, a, a very, very high growth, right? Double digits in some countries like Angola and others. And there are mu entire mutual funds now looking at African equities and, and things like this. Even American pension funds are looking at Africa and front, what are called frontier markets and so forth. Now, 10 years ago, five years ago, if we were to ask, how do we help Africa? How do we help the poor? The world is so unfair. You would say, Europeans and Americans got to cut their farm subsidies, right? This is a hideously immoral policy. Got to cut the farm subsidies. Otherwise, Africans will never be able to export their goods. Well, OK, five years later today, when, I, when we talk about this, no one really mentions that anymore. Obviously, it would be nice if Europeans cut their farms up these, or if we did, or if the Japanese did. But I think the people realize that that's not going to happen, right? Africans realize it for sure. At the same time, these emerging markets started growing so rapidly that they reached around the world, start around the world and started trading uh, you know, with everyone and buying from everyone. So Africa exports to America and Europe, yes. But it also exports to South America and to Asia and the Middle East and beyond. Right? So the integration of this neglected region into global trade has been the best thing for it, because it can diversify its export destinations. Right? It's no longer subject only to policies in Brussels and Washington. And so the best thing that ever happened to the have-nots, to the excluded countries, is the rise of those non-core emerging markets, like China and India and Brazil and so forth, because they circumvent those stringent Western rules and policies that have hampered a lot of these poor countries. And they've brought them in. So I call those emerging markets and so forth the second world. And I'd like to say that the best thing that ever happened to the third world was the rise of the second world, because the first world has only done so much for them. Uh, in the back. Thanks for a very enlightening talk, just like your book, which I've read. I have a question for you. Um, I don't know if you would agree that you could argue that what has happened in MENA, the Middle East and North Africa, and the what I call the perpetual Arab Spring, because it may not turn to anything other than what it is right now, at least anytime soon, um, that that perfect storm has existed in failing and failed states for a long time. I'm sort of wondering what your view is on why you think the spring, if you will, has not yet sprung in the failed and failing states, and whether you think it eventually will. So you the, mean the, the non-Arab countries? Exactly, like the right. Zimbabwe's and the Pakistan's oh, sure. of the world. Sure. Well, you know, for one thing, I mean, part of the explanation is that is to answer why it's happened across the Arab world. And that's, of course, because of a common language, satellite television, Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, those technologies and and communications networks, and the internal Arab migration, which is a not very widely studied phenomenon, and intra-Arab trade, and so forth, and the, and the kind of rise of these cosmo these Arab melting pots, like Dubai and Doha, and so forth, where Arabs get together. So the Arab conversation has taken on a new instantaneous life, and, and that started to happen about 10 years ago. And that made it possible, partially possible. There are many, again, many other deeper factors that I talked about earlier for what happened in one country to really affect the others. And hence, you have this kind of you know, domino effect that people are calling it. Because the Arab phenomenon is being watched around the world, but isn't necessarily immediately impacting uh, you know, India and Russia and Pakistan and Zimbabwe and so forth, I'm not surprised that it hasn't all of a sudden led to a global domino of all bad post-colonial governments falling. These things take time. Even in the Arab world, uh, I wouldn't be as cynical as many people have become. They said, oh, the Arab Spring has turned into winter. You know, I mean, I, I kind of hate these cliches, actually. <laughs> because if this were a marathon, we're only at mile two, right? That's it, mile two. Do you really know who's going to win the marathon at mile two? Not in a real marathon, not in this one either. It's really unfair to say that this is turned into winter, that uh, like other you know, situations in the past, you're going to have this, you know, repression or regression towards more repression because Syria and Iran have realized, uh-oh, if you loosen up just a little bit, you give them an inch, they're going to take a yard, right? 
I think that the, the genie is actually out of the bottle in a lot of these places because, again, those underlying conditions have not been reversed. Syria has been stagnant. Iran has been stagnant. Just because the leadership holds on a little bit longer than we would like because we're obviously pretty impatient and, and eager, it doesn't mean that they're going to hold on forever, right? They may fall at mile three or mile four or maybe even mile 17, but eventually they will. And what component of that inevitable change is going to trace itself back to this particular Arab Spring versus those deeper phenomena is something obviously we can debate and debate and debate, but it'll vary case by case because this isn't Eastern Europe. This isn't 1989. It's not one common regime type across 13 countries. And when the Soviet Union collapses, they all sort of you know shed that yoke and gradually they all go back to uh, history of liberal 19th century constitutionalism that they at various points in time enjoyed and then gradually become members of the European Union. It's not, there is, those conditions are not there in, in, in the Arab world. You have 22 Arab countries, you have 22 different governments. There's at least four kinds of Arab uh, states. I mean, there's uh, oil rich and oil poor, or, you know, resource rich, resource poor, and monarchies and non-monarchies. So when you, when you think about the Arab world and the future of what's going on, just remember that you have to you have a minimum of four different kinds of answers because it really depends on where they fall in that quadrant. So, you know, I dispute that it's all being rolled back. Uh, you know, reactionary uh, responses such as in, by Assad and, and others are obviously predictable. Um, and, uh, and I don't think that there's going to be one, one common outcome, and that, that's totally fine with me. You know, I mean, we've had much less... I mean, Libya is in a horrible situation, so is Bahrain, so is Syria. And yet, for anyone who's spent time traveling in the Arab world and knows these governments, this could have been even uglier, even more brutal, even more violent, where you really turn your head away. Instead, a lot of us, I hope, are still tuning in and, and, and cheering on a little bit. So this could have been so much worse, given how brutal and, and horrific these, these regimes are. And quite frankly, logically speaking, from the mere argument that very few of these governments could have been worse, I think things will eventually get better. Sir. The, uh, there's an analogy of mega diplomacy. There's an analogy of mega diplomacy in the high tech world. A uh, hundred years ago, with large corporations, with innovators, then came venture capital, private equity, uh, the cooperation between the universities like Stanford and the government funding different projects like at Bell Labs, and it's fostered competition. And look at the innovation we've right. had. So the question is how, how to use that model maybe oh. for some of these other problems that need to be solved. That is, uh, that is the model. And you know, whether it's called the cluster model or the quad model, the Silicon Valley you know, effect, where you have government-sponsored research from DARPA and other labs, and it gets commercialized. You have the companies in one place. You fund and have the innovation from the academic side, such as Stanford and others, or MIT Media Labs. They commercialize things well. So you've got your government, your academic, your corporate sort of synthesis there and a nice enabling local government environment, low tax rates, and all these kinds of good infrastructure, and all these kinds of things. Yes, of course, right? So when I look around the world and I say, well, which governments are doing it? Which in which states, to be more sort of accurate, in which states do you see that happening? Not in this one anymore, unfortunately, right? Um, some people describe DARPA, people who know it much better than me, it's a place that isn't investing enough anymore in those long-range internet-like things, right? Those, those, those total game-changing creations, life-altering uh, creations like, like the internet, which is, which is too bad. On a, on a more modest scale, though, if you go to a place like uh, Sweden, right, their state innovation agency, it's called Vinova, um, is investing in new biotechnology parks and training the next generation of students uh, to, to, to do smart infrastructure, smart grids, energy efficiency, particularly energy efficiency and biotechnology, some of these leading sectors of the future economies, alternative energy and so forth. Massive state investments in those areas because they either have the money, which we don't have, or they think longer term, which we don't do. But you put those two together, and there are a host of governments around the world that are upping their R&D budgets and doing all these kinds of things, whether it's uh, China or in Korea or Singapore or a couple of the European governments. But it's not happening as much here, unfortunately. Uh, but is that the model, as you suggested, that we should be using in thinking about how to solve public goods kinds of problems? Yes. Uh, are there places in the world that are actually doing it? Yes. Uh, <laughs> where are we one of them? No. Uh, over here. 
Um, earlier on in your discussion, uh, talking about regions and referring to the West, including South America, um, and the recent visit of uh, President Obama, I can't recall the last time an American president spent time in the region. And hasn't China really beaten us to it anyway? No. Yeah, that, that's one of those. I mean, you know, I, I, I wrote my first book about this. I went to every region of the world, and I said, what's Europe doing here? What's America doing here? What's China doing here? And I created, you know, looked at all the economic numbers and the diplomatic relations and the kind of trends going forward. And there was, you know, it, it, that was about four or five years ago. And, and today, still, there are people who say, uh-oh, China's eating our lunch, you know, uh, even in our own backyard. You know, they're building a port in Cuba. They're uh, Brazil's second biggest trade partner. Uh, they're investing in major infrastructure projects across Latin America. They're buying, you know, all of Chile's Panama copper. Canal. Sorry? Panama Canal. Panama Canal. The, the direction is going to reverse. And they're going to, Venezuela is going to cut off oil to us and send it all to China. I mean, we've been heard a lot of this stuff in the last um, five, six years. This is one region where China is still not, you know, the big player. We, we still are, right? Africa is different. Africa in five or six African countries, China is very st structurally, you know, important, particularly the oil-producing countries. In the Far East, very much so. Central Asia, China is, is the game in town. But in South America, there's still a very tremendous opportunity to to respond to that perceived threat or, or challenge, um, because China really just wants the commodities. And those countries owe their growth. I mean, the fact that they were able to pay off IMF loans ahead of schedule, they owe it to the commodities boom, which is, of course, driven to some extent by growing Chinese demand. So they're grateful for China. They're also scared viscerally of China. I just spent a week in Brazil all of last week. And um, what, was, what in my first book, reflected the tone of a strategic partnership between China and Brazil has now become this uh, sort of, you know, really under the palpable sense of almost hostility. Because Brazilians, if you make shoes in Brazil, or whatever it is you make, in, if you make anything but chopping wood or, ex or raising cows, China is putting you out of business. Um, and now China wants to make airplanes. And Brazil is actually the third largest manufacturer of airplanes in the world, Embraer, behind Airbus and Boeing. They're scared of that, too, although I wouldn't want to fly in a Chinese-made plane until they've flown a lot of flights in Asia first. Um, so, But I, I really think that the mood is shifting away, and America is sort of you know, welcome back more than more than ever before. Uh, and I think that's why Obama's visit was very well timed. So again, you know, be wary of the sort of straight line projection. Oop, China invested only five billion dollars in Latin America twenty years ago and it's a hundred billion today, second only to us and to Europe. Of course, yeah, that straight line projection holds for a while and under certain conditions, but it can plateau, it can be reversed, lots of things can happen. Ma'am. I would like to ask you an economic question. Given the, how can we be expected to compete on a global basis? China has a reserve requirement of between 15 and 17 percent, as does another prosperous country, Turkey. We're down to two and a half percent. Doesn't that undermine our ability to utilize the banking system for expansion? And what would you envision as a way in which the world can move toward a new world order with an improved financial system, what would you suggest? Right. Um, and I see Noel standing there, so I guess I'll have to make this quick. Um, I, uh, I think that in terms of, despite the reserve requirement differential, we have actually hoped that the very cash-rich uh, financial institutions, uh, whether it's banks or Wall Street and American companies in general, would actually be spending that money because we've lowered interest rates and all these other things to invest in uh, job creation, infrastructure, all these kinds of things. And yet, they haven't been doing it for political and other kinds of reasons. And they can't be forced to do it. And that's obviously what a big part of the Democratic backlash against Obama is, is saying you let them off the hook, and they're not even spending all this money they have. So that's our domestic problem, which is really regrettable, of course. And I, I would say it's embarrassing and, and, and sort of outrageous. Um, but, but that's what it is. So uh, on the global question in terms of the financial system and how to make it, you know, how to stabilize it, you know, in terms of the traditional institutions that we have now, the role of the IMF in potentially shepherding uh, 
the world towards a neutral currency basket and, 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 and not just dollar dependent, you know, I guess there can be a role for, for global institutions in that. Obviously, it's very important. And it's also one issue on which almost everyone agrees, except, of course, you know, uh, the Treasury to some extent. Uh, but it's, it's, it's more or less inevitable. And hopefully, it will be managed well. That would be one major thing, obviously. I think, again, the development of regional, um, uh, regional um, uh, development banks and so forth are playing a very big role in Asia and elsewhere, so I think that would be stabilizing at the same time. Um, so th those would be two of the big things that I think will help us to get there on, on a global level.